ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಧಿಮಂದ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮುದಿತ and um, he um, travels extensively sharing timeless wisdom of Bhagavad Gita, Shrima Bhagavatam and ancient sacred texts and um, he's married to um, her grace near Kula and I believe they have one, one child, one daughter. Okay. No. <laughs> 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 oh, wow, okay, that's unturned. I'm so sorry. That we know of. <laughs> so much from, um, from his grace's classes. I started listening to his classes a year ago, and um, they really have transformed my, my life in so many ways, and I'm so, so delighted to, um, to be here introducing you and listen to this wonderful top, topic of unbreakable determination. So please give um, a big round of applause for Thank you, Ragini, for that thoughtful and uh, very deeply felt introduction. We, we, f- we feel, um, my wife and I are, feel very honored to be here at this Avanti school, which is, uh, has become known the world round. Just approaching the building, we can see the attention to detail. and. It's, uh, it instills uh, enthusiasm to see a community coming together with such purpose to educate children, to take care of one another in such an exemplary way. And to those of you who are new, uh, first time here to Avanti School, we welcome you. <coughs> We're also new here, my wife and I, so uh, <coughs> we share your sense of newness. Hare Krishna. <laughs> I first offer my, my respects to my spiritual master, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who, through his determination, brought the teachings of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Krishna to the Western world and then spread them all over the world. Many of you have heard his story and how he had received an order from his spiritual master to spread Krishna consciousness around the world. His spiritual master was a a greatly revered spiritual teacher in India, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who had become a great scholar by the time he was around uh, 12 years old. Even when he was 7 years old, he had memorized the entire Bhagavad Gita to 700 verses and was able to give commentary on each one of the verses. He uh, had been awarded the titles uh, Siddhanta and Saraswati for his great scholarship in astrology and astronomy. And uh, <clears throat> he had imbibed from his father, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, another great Acharya in his own right, the, the impetus to help the world by giving spiritual knowledge. So, the first time that my spiritual master and the the founder of the ISKCON movement, International Society for Krishna Consciousness, met his spiritual master, he was uh, just a young man in his early 20s, just starting a family, and he was a little skeptical about spiritual teachers because when he grew up, his father had been very enthusiastic about inviting sadhus or holy men to come to the house to give blessings to his child Abai. And at that time, as a child, he had seen a lot of pretenders, but his father didn't care. He, he decided to invite everybody and let God sort them out later. 
But when his friend invited Abai to come meet this particular spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and his friend was so emphatic about it that he finally relented and went there. And as he went in, and as is customer, customary before, for a saintly person, he was uh, out of culture, offering his uh, obeisances, bowing down before him. Before he could even get up, his spiritual master, his future spiritual master, uh, began to size him up and saw he and his friends there as being very worthy uh, people to take the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the teachings that could help the world spiritually. And he began instructing him that you're young, you're from this country, you should take these teachings and spread them around the world. And there was much more in that meeting that day, but and as a young man he took those instructions within his heart and he kept there, kept them there, incubated them there over many years. And it's an amazing story how later in life, it wasn't until he was actually 70 years old, they could fully uh, embark on the journey that would fulfill the instruction of his spiritual master, which was to take the teachings to the West. So thinking about determination, uh, those who study the life story of Srila Prabhupada, as he's called his uh, spiritual title, can see uh, what it might take to carry on a task, even when it seems like it's against all odds that one might succeed. And in the teachings of Rupa Goswami, who's one of the great saints in the line of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who wrote extensively about the practice of devotional service, there is a way in which one can decide to take up any practice in this life in order to improve oneself. And most human beings do that to one degree or another. So Rupa Goswami wrote specifically about the practice of bhakti. Bhakti yoga is considered the, on the rung of what is called the yoga ladder, the highest rung. The way in which one can uh, most readily uh, connect oneself to the Supreme, our divine source, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, through the practice of bhakti. There are many teachings that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave, and most extent, he gave them most extensively to a couple of his disciples. One was named Sanatana Goswami, and another is Rupa Goswami. And the Rupa Goswami wrote a book called the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, which our spiritual master translated as a summary called The Nectar of Devotion. And he also wrote a book, did Rupa Goswami, called the Upadeshamrita. So Upadesh means instruction, and Amrita means nectar. So this book was also translated and commentated by our spiritual master, and he called it the nectar of instruction. So in this concise handbook on bhakti, the practice of bhakti yoga, he mentions various qualities that one should imbibe, develop, in order to progress on the path of yoga. And one of them is determination. And so there's a question then, can one develop determination? Is it something that you just have inherently? Or can you organize your life in such a way that you can have more determination? What do you think? Okay, A means that you, you can develop it, and B means that you're born with it, and you can't develop it. Because if it's B, we can call off the rest of the talk. <laughs> A? Oh, good. Okay, fantastic. All right, so here are a few uh, ideas that are consistent with the overall body of scriptures that talk about how to organize one's life 
in such a way that one can have more determination to advance in bhakti. The first one is uh, to work from your natural strength. And I'll just read a, a passage from a commentary that Srila Prabhupada gave to a section of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is a fascinating story about an elephant named Gajendra. Now, Gajendra had been, in his previous life, a king named Indradugna. And he had made an offense towards a sage who cursed him to, in his next life, become a dumb animal, an elephant. Of course, elephants are not so dumb, but compared to being a king, it was definitely a demotion. And when he was born as an elephant in the next life, he was in a very prestigious position as the king of the elephants. He's respected by all the elephants in the jungle, and he was uh, very happily situated. It was a heavenly planet. So the story starts off where he lives in the heavenly planets with him walking through the forest towards this huge lake with his family and all the other elephants, all the other animals get out of the way. And he has a kind of swagger as he's going through the jungle and he gets to the, to the lake in this heavenly planet and is taking a bath as elephants like to do. And he was spraying his family members with his trunk to cool them off. And just when he was thinking, life is really good, suddenly a crocodile grabbed onto his leg. Has anybody ever had this? <laughs> One way or another, a crocodile comes along when, just when I think, oh, I've got it made, and grabbed to his leg. And at first he thought, I'll just shake him loose. I'm a big, strong elephant. What can a little crocodile do? So the fight began. And then there was a point during the fight, which went on for thousands of years, that it came into his mind that I can't win this fight. And the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is one of the, is the most important book on Bhakti Yoga, explains that the elephant is more powerful than the crocodile on the land, but in the water, the crocodile is more powerful than the elephant. And this is relevant to the story because in this context, in the fight between Gajendra and the crocodile, Prabhupada gives the, some very practical instructions for those who are engaged in the process of bhakti yoga. And here's an excerpt from his purport. For those of you at home who are keeping score, this is 8.2.30. Prabhupada writes, Thereafter, because of being pulled into the water and fighting for many long years, the elephant became diminished in his mental, physical, and sensual strength. The crocodile, on the, other, on the contrary, being an animal of the water, increased in enthusiasm, physical strength, and sensual power. That was the verse, and here's the purport excer excerpt. The soldiers in this Krishna consciousness movement must always possess physical strength, enthusiasm, and sensual power. To keep themselves fit, they must therefore place themselves in a normal condition of life. What constitutes a normal condition will not be the same for everyone. And therefore, there are divisions of Varnashrama, Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, Brahmachari, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, and Sannyas. I deeply appreciated this commonsensical advice. Krishna gives it also in the Bhagavad Gita where he, he says, Yukta haravi harasya, yukta cheshtasya karmasu, yukta swapna babodasya, yogu bhavati dukaha. And that is that in order to become free from misery in life, one should neither eat too much or too little. One should not sleep too much, nor too little. And one should not recreate too much, nor too little. 
This is called yukta, or balanced. And everyone is born with a certain set of senses. Uh, Krishna talks about this in the Bhagavad Gita. Shariram yaravapnoti, uh, starting with how we leave this body and we come into a new body. Shotram chakshush parshanam cha, rasanam graham cha. He's describing the different senses that we get. And so we all have a, a normal condition of life according to the group of senses that we've attained in this lifetime. And so one of the ways in which uh, one can remain determined and steady is to find out how to re remain in a, a normal and healthy state of life. If one is out of balance uh, and working in something that is not according to one's nature, you're too much disturbed by the lifestyle, then it's very difficult to remain focused and determined. So th there's, uh, in many of the teachings, uh, spiritual teachings of the world, there's uh, the advice to, to find a, a natural condition that one can, can work in. Uh, don't over-endeavor, which is another one of the qualities uh, or tenets that Rupa Goswami mentions. If you over-endeavor in your material life, it's very difficult to stay determined if you feel out of balance. So there are a few ways in which uh, Prabhupada talks about prioritizing one's life. And this was from a list that one of Prabhupada's secretaries found that uh, Srila Prabhupada compiled. It has four items on it uh, for, for those who want to stay steady and determined in yoga. So the first is health. That's at the top of the list. You have to stay healthy. Second is uh, sadhana, which means your practice. Third is service, and fourth is reading. So he mentioned these, these four items, and Prabhupada himself showed that it was important to take care of health. He lived a very regulated life, albeit uh, austere compared to most people's um, uh, standard, but he was very careful about what he ate. He exercised every day by going for a long walk. Uh, he took massage regularly, which he uh, said was uh, yoga for, for older people and so forth. But, but it wasn't that he just neglected his body and, and just said, it, it's, a, it's a spiritual process, so it doesn't matter what happens to my body. He actually, you have to have health in order to practice properly. So uh, those who are in sattva gun or the higher modes of material nature take care of themselves because the, what we have here is a remarkable biological robot that's been bequeathed to us by material nature. It's actually a very advanced uh, technological item, more advanced than the iPhone. Seven. <laughs> I mean, it's remarkable what the body does, but one has to take care of it. So taking care of health is mentioned uh, here in this purport. Also, I gave evidence from Krishna in the, in the Bhagavad Gita saying, be yukta, uh, be careful about your health. Don't sleep too much, don't sleep too, too little. So this is something you can attend to uh, without feeling guilty that you're not being spiritual if you take care of your health, because you need to have your health to stay determined and, and work steadily. Uh, sadhana means practice. It's important to find uh, a practice that you can do every day and that challenges you a little bit so that you get what is called numerical strength. If you do too little, uh, you won't be inspired. But numerical strength means to set some goals for your spiritual practice. The Goswamis of Vrindavan, who were, as I mentioned before, Rupa and Sanatan and others, they counted how much they chanted every day, how much they studied and so forth. They measured it very carefully. So that, that kept them regulated and strong in their practices. So this is one of the items that's very important. Service and reading. So, um, Sasrup 
Maharaj, who is a very senior devotee, joined the Krishna consciousness movement in the 1960s and had, um, at one point, gotten a mobile home in order to uh, facilitate his traveling around America. And as a sannyasi, he was feeling a little bit, maybe this is too much to have my own mobile home. Maybe I should sleep under a tree or something. Because, as you know, some of the Goswamis in Vrindavan, they slept under a different tree every night. So I know early in the Krishna consciousness movement, a lot of young devotees, including myself, had this idea of being overly austere in many ways, eating a handful of puffies to maintain oneself or something like that. And so uh, he had a little sheepishly asked Srila Prabhupada about uh, if it was okay for him to have this mobile home to travel and preach in. And he wrote that Prabhupada replied, keep yourself comfortable so that you can serve nicely. Consistent with this advice, keep yourself comfortable so that you can serve nicely. So everyone has a, that doesn't mean to, um, to forget about spiritual life, but it means that, that you have to find that balance, uh, that you're comfortable enough uh, physically, mentally, so, so that you can maintain your, your spiritual strength and your practice and your determination. So this, this is a factor. If you're out of balance in your health and your comfort zone, then it's very difficult to have determination to move forward. And one, as Prabhupada used to say, one man's food is another man's poison. Everybody has their certain standards, so you have to find yours so that you can balance your life. Does that sound practical? Yes. Does it even sound spiritual? <laughs> Not yet, Vaisheshika. But none, nonetheless, this is, this is an item to attend to, and often uh, it can get neglected in the name of, I have to be austere. Hare Krishna. So, uh, the second tenet of determination is one of my favorites, my all-time favorites, because I'm always fascinated with... Uh, the concept of volition, which means that we have free choice. We can decide to do things at any time, change our mind. So I really like this word deliberate. It actually, um, deliberate can be pronounced as deliberate or deliberate. Right? So in order to be deliberate in one's activities, one, also, one has to first deliberate very carefully. So the next tenet is to choose deliberate practice over luck. Deliberate practice over luck. Please say that. Deliberate That's right. Deliberate practice over luck. Uh, one may not uh, overtly express this, that I'm just depending on luck. But let me give you the definition of luck. Success or failure apparently brought by chance rather than one's own actions. Success or failure apparently brought by chance rather than one's own actions. So I might subconsciously think that, uh, well, why am I in certain situations? Why aren't I more spiritually advanced? And I might think that it will just come to me automatically, but I have to be deliberate in my activities and in my choices in life and not simply wait for luck to visit me. And here are a few... Uh, of the elements of uh, deliberation. One is uh, thorough consideration. You have to give thorough consideration to the, to the discipline that you're practicing. And in this case, bhakti yoga. You have to think about it very carefully. Study it from many different angles. Hear about it, uh, what it means and what it is. Also, it means an awareness of consequences. This can be uh, very sobering in one's life. If, if one understands clearly, deliberates, and then understands what the consequences of one's actions are. And finally, another sense of deliberate, according to the definitions that I looked up in various places. Here's an element of deliberation and deliberate action, which is slow, steady, and allowing time to mature. 
So this is actually a main practice of bhakti, and that is what we're doing tonight. We're coming together, and we are uh, deliberating. We're, in fact, the, the word deliberate, it comes uh, within it as the word libra, which um, actually has to do with these pan scales, which you may have seen if you go to marketplaces in India. I don't know if they have them here in the UK. But there's a weight on one side, and the other side you would put the produce that you're looking to buy, for instance, a cauliflower or something like that, and then you see how it balances out. So this idea of a scale, uh, you deliberate, you look at, you weigh the consequences, you look carefully and, and hear about uh, the, the science very carefully. So that's what uh, great sages do. They come together and they, they talk about the consequences of various actions that they might take in life. And they record those things. In the Bhagavad Gita, you find, as uh, <clears throat> one of my friends and uh, a great leader in the Christian consciousness movement, Hri Dayananda Maharaj likes to say, Krishna is not a religious fanatic. In the Bhagavad Gita, he presents what your options are. But he doesn't condemn anyone or force you to do anything. In fact, at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, he says to his student, Arjuna, now I've told you everything. Uh, you can deliberate on this and then do as, as you wish to do. And in fact, according to the Acharyas, he was ready to speak the whole thing again because he really wanted Arjuna to take the right action, but he didn't force him. And so Bhagavad Gita, for instance, is there for deliberation. Someone may say, well, I lack, the, uh, I lack spiritual intelligence. I make bad decisions. Well, then the, the solution is to read Bhagavad Gita regularly because Krishna gives uh, direct, commonsensical advice throughout the Bhagavad Gita. And if you look at it and study it carefully every day, then th the same advice that Krishna is giving will become uh, enmeshed in your intelligence. You'll pick it up and you'll look at the world in a different way, in a more considerate way, and, it, and your actions will be more deliberate. When I first read the Bhagavad Gita, I was particularly impressed by the effect that the three modes of material nature have on my life. And so I had never considered those categories before. So when I was walking around uh, after reading Bhagavad Gita, I would notice, oh yes, this uh, is an effect of the mode of passion. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives clear instruction that if you, if you associate with the mode of passion, he gives uh, this example that it's like um, nectar in the beginning and poison in the end. That's a little scary, but it sounds really familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Things that are like nectar in the beginning and poison in the end. But because i have reading Bhagavad Gita and, have, and deliberating and looking at the world in a certain way, I think, oh, I better not touch that. Because although it looks like nectar in the beginning, in the end, it's going to be poison. It'll come back and bite you. And you have to be careful. Or uh, the mode of goodness, you can say, <coughs> is, Krishna says, is like poison in the beginning and nectar in the end. Does that sound familiar? Yes, and if one fortifies one's intellect with this knowledge, uh, deliberate uh, knowledge, and understands that choices make a difference, one's choices make a difference, you begin to make much better choices uh, through deliberation. And so then one can uh, triangulate in one's life and decide what is the best kind of practice and the best way to practice uh, bhakti so that I advance, so that I actually get the result. And all the information is there, all the guidance is there. I, I, I definitely need to imbibe it so that I can understand what it is. And then very deliberately uh, practice the tenets of bhakti and not just wait for some result to come of its own accord. So those are two tenets of determination. But before I move on to any others, 
I'll take some reflections. And that is anything that you heard so far that uh, stuck in your mind, any concept that you found useful. And just as a reminder, a reflection is not a question. A question has a question mark at the end, and I may have to answer it. But at this point, let's not do that. Let's just give reflection. It means uh, give back anything that you heard so far that you found to be interesting or useful that you might put in your pocket and take out of here. And if you meet somebody outside in the parking lot who grabs you by the arm and says, what was that guy talking about? You'll say what? Yes, right over here. Very conveniently on the opposite side. <laughs> Not at all. I'm just... Um, I love the point you made about um, how we should endeavour to be slow, steady, and having time to mature. Um, <clears throat> because I think um, the bit which I think I personally need to work on is not so much slow, but steady. Um, and I think steadiness is the thing that gives rise to maturity. Thank you for bringing that point. I I like an, a word that's related to steadiness, which is consistency. And if you start small, but you're consistent, it'll have a prof profound effect. There are many uh, s systems of motivation. There's one in, in Japan called Kaizen, which talks about how to develop a good new habit. In fact, the, the author of this book that I re read recently said that uh, he, he, he was, he's a psychologist and he talked about various um, patients that he's had and how he helped them through this process of making uh, consistent, small but consistent uh, improvements in their life. So one woman had visited the doctor and the doctor said, unless you lose weight right away, you're going to die. So she was a little motivated and she talked to him about how to overcome her weight problem, she said it was practically impossible for her to exercise. It had no motivation. And all the, she, basically what she did was watch television all day and then eat at the same time. And so how to get out of that cycle? He told her that, uh, okay, so when a commercial comes on, you stand up. <laughs> and then come back to me in a week. So every, when a commercial comes on, you stand up and then you sit back down again and then come back next week. So she came back next week and said, I did it. And uh, he appreciated it very much and said, now when the commercial comes on, then you stand up and then you march in place five times. One, two, three, four, five. Then you can sit down. So she did it and came back the next week and said, I did it again. She was getting small victories. And then, uh, you know, it led to just a little more and a little more discipline in her activity. And then he had her out walking around the block once, which was a huge departure from her normal lifestyle. And I'll, I'll cut to the end, which was that she was able to, through incremental and consistent practice, uh, albeit uh, small in the beginning, to incrementally improve to the point where uh, she was able to get on a regular exercise program, feel uh, really good about herself because she was able to deliberately take these instructions and practice them. So this consistent kind of improvement in, in the practice of bhakti also is very helpful. Be patient and deliberate and consistent. And even if it's a tiny victory, it, it will be helpful. You get momentum going that way. Thanks for bringing that up. Three more. Yes. I like, the point. I like the point that you made that you have to, the personal health comes first and then you, you can uh, spread it. Uh. Yes. My friend uh, Satyadev Prabhu was a paramedic for 20 years. And the first thing they taught him in paramedic school is a dead paramedic can't save anybody. <laughs> He said, when you, when you approach the, the scene of an accident and make sure that you don't get shot, 
poisoned, uh, electrocuted, or killed in any way, because then you won't be of any use to anybody. So you have to be, you have to be careful uh, to take care of the assets that you already have in order to move forward. Thank you. Yes. about to work from the natural strength mm -hmm. um, because that's from the positive as opposed to focusing on all the negatives that you perhaps need to improve. Yes, uh, thank you for making that point. The question is how to make advancement and the answer always is by starting from where you are now. You can't do more than you can do. In fact, Krishna makes this point in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam to Uddhava. He says, Sve Sve Adhikariya Nisha Saguna Parikirtita Vipariya to Dosha Syad. And this means Sve Sve Adhikari. It means everyone has a personal Adhikari or qualification or capacity. And he says, if you act sincerely and to the best of your ability in that capacity and do what you can with what you have now, he said, this is a good quality. And then he says, Vipariya, which means the opposite, to dosha syad. If, if you try to do more than you're qualified for, then he said, dosha, this is a fault. So do what, do what you, you have adhikari for. Bhaktivinoda Thakur then comments on this in his Chaitanya uh, Shikshamrita, and he says that spiritual life is like climbing a ladder. You have to put one foot on the rung, and then when it feels solidly situated, then you step to the next rung. Now he makes the point, uh, don't try to go too fast because you can slip from the ladder. But then he says, don't try to go too slow either because then your advancement will be distant. He said, you have to calculate uh, using your own uh, intelligence to see how you're situated and then keep moving forward from one step to the next. Thank you. Balance Two more. Balance. Consequences of all your, what's good for you, you need to... Balance, and, and you, have to, you have to weigh the consequences. Weigh the consequences. This is one of the aspects of deliberation, is to understand what are the consequences of my actions. And so, uh, in the Gita, Krishna talks about how if you uh, associate with various modes of material nature, you're going to get a certain kind of result. And the, the, the best of all conclusions is that if you consistently associate with Krishna, who is above the three modes of material nature, then you'll extricate yourself from all problems in this world. This is uh, a simple way in which to uh, make advancement is to uh, observe how others have, the great souls uh, before us have conducted their lives, and then to follow in their footsteps. We can't imitate, because they may do great things that we can't do. We can follow in their footsteps. Thank you very much. In fact, just one more point on that, because it's, it's such a compelling idea. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the first canto, Sutta Goswami says, Bejare mune yotagre bhagavan tamadhoksajam sattvam vishudam shemaya kalpante ye nutaniha. And that is that previously all the great sages worshipped Lord Vishnu because uh, they knew he was beyond the three modes of material nature and they knew they could derive the highest benefit. And then it says that those who uh, follow in the footsteps of those great sages who performed that worship, even if they're not great sages, they're just ordinary people, starting from what may seem like a substandard spiritual condition. If they, those ordinary people follow in the footsteps of those great sages, they're eligible for the same result. So wherever you're starting from, if your, your intention is aligned properly, and you consistently try to follow the process, to the best of your ability, according to your capacity, you'll attain the same result as those great sages. It's a good system, right? One more. Yes? From the story of Gajendra. Uh, From the story of Gajendra, yes. Gajendra was in water and crocodile was more powerful 
there. So I relate with the online <coughs> where uh, when we are in passionate mode uh, or uh, when we are uh, when we feel weak and when we are in association of uh, devotees and or in temple, then uh, I feel strong in spiritual life. So uh, it's uh, you are right. Thousands of years of many lives going on. Uh, yeah, you have to find. Uh, the, the kind of lifestyle that gives you enough strength so that you can fight with Maya. And this is what Prabhupada talks about. We're in a battle. We're fighting with, with material nature. And he, me he mentions the Varnashrama there, which essentially means that everyone is born with a certain uh, conditioning. And we, we feel comfortable in different stations in life. So there are various ashramas that one can live in. Does everyone know what the word ashrama means? What does it mean? What would you say? What's that? Stages. Stages of life. Yes. What else? Shelter. 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 Yes. Degree of renunciation. Degree of renunciation. Yeah. Very practically, in the Varnashrama system, there are there. There's the Brahmachari ashram, which is a student level, and the students uh, pr practice in a certain way: celibacy, a great study, learning how to serve a spiritual master, and so forth. And then after that comes what? Unless one decides to stay Brahmachari for life, and, which is rare. But then, what what, what is the next uh, step? Grahasta, which means that one uh, takes some responsibility to to live in a house with a family, maintain the family, and so forth, right? Sounds familiar, probably, to a lot of people here at Avanti School. Then, uh, after that, Vana Prasta, which is a natural stage that takes place, a gradual a, a step that takes place after one's been in Grahasta for some time, that uh, husband and wife live together more for service than they do for uh, thinking about economic development, maintaining family, and so forth. And then finally, there's the S word, sannyas. <laughs> Which, now, interestingly, in the Vedic scriptures that, that describe these various stages of life, there are all there. There are also subcategories which are very gradual. For instance, even sannyas, there's uh, kudichak, bahudak, parvajakacharya, and paramahamsa. These four stages. And in kudichak, when somebody takes sannyas. The, the, uh, tr traditionally the man would uh, leave the house at a certain time and he would live nearby in a, in a little dwelling and the family would still cook for him and bring him food because there's a little slot they just shove it in there like, you okay? Sure. Um, <laughs> and after that he, he gradually gets the strength to go out and collect uh, grains from the field and he'll you know, just depend on that. And then after that, Parvajakachari just wanders the world and depends on Krishna's mercy, whichever way it comes. And then finally, Paramahamsa, where he's just fully absorbed in thinking of Krishna 24 hours a day. But it's gradual. And even with Vanaprastha, there's several stages that one takes place. So the Varnashram is meant to give one this opportunity to, to move by degrees, um, steadily, staying in according to one's adhikari, that what, what one can do right now in order to, to move forward in life. So, interestingly, I wanted to bring this up about the word ashrama. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said uh, emphatically, shrama evihi kevalam. One should avoid shrama. You know what shrama is? It's very hard work with no result. In other words, uh, th in fact, this is what the sages are saying at Naima Saranya. It's like avoid uh, wasting your life by working so hard to try to get some result. That generally people uh, uh, work very hard in the beginning of their life to accumulate lots of money. And um, they give up their health to do so. Sacrifice health to get wealth. And later in life, my friend Satyadev Prabhu told me, about the medical system, at least in America, then you give up your wealth to give your health back <laughs> later because 
Uh, you don't get any government assistance until you're broke. Uh, so there's this cycle. This is called shrama. Everyone say shrama. shrama. Don't do shrama, just say shrama, okay. <laughs> so what is ashrama? When you put an akar in front of this word shrama, it means no more shrama. So you're living in a state where you're avoiding useless labor. You're, you're not working hard for nothing. You're minimizing the kind of work which is just meant to, to uh, take care of the body. Now, it sounds contradictory because we just talked about how you have to take care of the body and be healthy, right? But Krishna says yukta, not too much and not too little, just the right amount so that you can stay healthy. So this is ashrama life, wherever you are. Uh, do what you're doing purposefully uh, to make spiritual advancement. And if you're taking care of your health, you don't have to overdo it. You just have to maintain the robot. It actually it maintains itself quite nicely. It's one of the aspects of having a, this robot. that it, it heals itself, it does all kinds of things self but, you, but you're supposed to do a little bit to, to help it along. Now I'm going to move on to a couple more points with your permission. Uh, I'm continuing actually on this uh, choose deliberate practice over luck. I mentioned numerical strength. So uh, this deliberate practice means that you should count what you're doing, how much you're doing it. So recently um, we created an app that's available for the iPhone and also for whatever that other thing is called, Android. And so on, on both of these platforms, no, I'm, nothing, yeah, I just can't remember what it is. Um, on both of these, you can get this app, and it tells you, see, there's various books available that are extremely important to read on a regular basis in order to make advancement in spiritual life. One of them is Bhagavad Gita, I mentioned that, because this is spoken directly by Krishna. And if you read that on a regular basis, then you'll have no more complaints in life. And if you don't read it on a regular basis, you'll have a lot of complaints. So, Bhagavad Gita, then there's Srimad Bhagavatam, one of the most highly recommended of all books. In fact, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, this is the perfect book. He calls it the Amala Purana. It, it has, it's the ultimate authority on all spiritual subject matters, and it goes into great detail. And there's 18,000 verses available, so that should keep you busy for a while. But one of the problems is you might look at all that and say, I don't have time for that. I can't read 18,000 verses with commentary and so forth. So the solution is, is to break it down into small parts. So in this app, you can look at any one of these books and then uh, choose how um, soon you'd like to finish it. And I propose, in the name of numerical strength, that you should know when you're going to finish the Bhagavad Gita next. Does anybody know the exact date and time that you'll finish reading the whole Bhagavad Gita? If, if I wake you up tonight at 1 o'clock in the morning and say, when are you going to finish the Bhagavad Gita? At what t you'll say what? <laughs> you won't know, right? But if you use this app, you can calculate exactly because it'll tell you the exact number of pages you have to read every, every day in order to finish within a particular amount of time. Same with the Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, when you know that, you'll be very inspired to move forward in your practice of reading, which is one of the points that Srila Prabhupada brought up. Um, now I'm checking on the time because I'm feeling quite absorbed here and I have a tendency to zoom right past it. It's 10 after 8, isn't it? Oh my goodness, okay. It's called. <laughs> Sorry, we're out of time, I can't help you. <laughs> it's called Be a Sage, page by page. And if you look on the app, at the App Store, under Be a Sage, you'll find it. It's the only one of its kind. It's free, by the way. And then the other thing is uh, teaching Krishna consciousness to others. This is an, an aspect of deliberate practice. It's a kind of practice to avail yourself to teach what you know to other people. And so if you just open your home uh, as a, a place where you uh, regularly, or at least occasionally, 
uh, invite other people in so that you can discuss spiritual subject matters, your whole home will become transformed. Because sociological studies show that when other people come into your home, you clean everything up and make it look nice, right? <laughs> what to speak of, if you invite a spiritually minded people over, you'll rearrange your whole life and you all, you know, start looking like, yeah, we're, we're really spiritual here. And because of that, you'll become spiritual. And so it's important to invite people into your, into your space and then teach what you know or at least facilitate, make an environment so that other people can come in and learn it. It's a natural thing. People invite people over to their homes to play what? Mahjong. You know what that is? I don't either, but they play it. Uh, checkers, chess, all kinds of things. People come over, they have biscuits and they drink all kinds of stuff. And the, that's uh, social life in the mode of passion, ignorance, and so forth, which has its consequences. But if you do the same thing, social life, you invite people in, and for the purpose of discussing spiritual knowledge, it is so sublime and easy because it's natural to have people over and have some refreshments and have good association with people. Uh, so that's w one of the easy ways to make rapid spiritual advancement through deliberate practice. And uh, finally, association. Uh, we become who we associate with, period. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Purusha prakriti stohi bhunte prakriti jangunan karanam gunasangosya sarasadyoni janmasu. Which means, if you want to know why you have any good or bad in your life, you can only look back to who you associated with. Because whoever you're associating with, will uh, develop your own personality and your own fortune. So if you don't like your fortune now, change your association. Get better association. And that can be done. Can it not? Please say yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, a couple more uh, quick ones. One is uh, for determination. Avoid distractions. There are ways to avoid distractions, and I'll tell you one of the easy ways. Get yourself a do not disturb sign. They have them at hotels so you can sneak in and you know, take one off the door when nobody's looking. No, don't do that. That's against. But if you make yourself a do not disturb sign, it's amazing how effective this is. If you live in an ashram, a family situation, when it's time for you to do your spiritual practice, be very deliberate and put that sign up on the door. Say, cannot be disturbed for the next five minutes or, or hour or whatever it is when you're doing your practice. Also, as they used to say on airplanes, I don't know if they're, power down everything. They used to say on United Airlines, anything with an on-off switch, turn it off. Because it calls to you while you're sitting there trying to meditate or read or chant your holy mantras. Your phone is going, come over here. So turn it off. Uh, turn everything off. Avoid distractions. There is a way to go through and eliminate. You, you could uh, take this up as a entrepreneurial endeavor, you could go around and help people get rid of all their distractions in their life. Just go around their house and debug it so there's no more distractions. You can do that in your own life very deliberately and that will help you gain determination because you won't be constantly dragged away from your goal in life. And one of the ways to do that, which is another principle, is to narrow your choices. Narrow your choices. Concentrate all your thoughts on the task at hand. And remember how when you focus, you can get so many things done. Just like when you take the sun's rays and you concentrate them through a magnifying glass, you can burn uh, a piece of wood. It, the, it becomes so hot. And now we're going to take a couple more um, reflections. Please reflect. Anything you heard? Yes. Avoid distractions, yes. What's that? Yes, yeah, she's doing her Gayatri, which is a, for those of you, it's a silent meditation where you're saying mantras. And you have to be very concentrated. 
and then the phone rings, and then you start thinking, you're doing neither. You're not answering the phone, and you're not chanting Gayatri anymore. So it's, it's, it's really uh, useless. So uh, turn it off ahead of time. If you do that deliberately, you'll have more determination. You, you can do that by arranging your environment. One more? Yes. Vrindarika. Vrindarika. Yeah, you won't have any more complaints. <laughs> Nothing to complain about because you, your, your intelligence will become instilled with uh, the Krishna's supreme intelligence because that's why he wrote it. He said, if you study this, it will purify your intelligence. Yeah, that's simple too. Nirkula? Definitely. That's how Weight Watchers works. Everyone knows they have to go in and get on that scale. And someone's going to give an accurate number. <laughs> and they'll be looking at you when you do it, too. So it's very motivating. So, uh, w one final point. You had a point? Definitely. Yes. yes. It was just what you were saying about Shrum and the over endeavor. And it's in some, a city like London, it's, over, it's an epidemic. Everybody over endeavors. And actually, if you break out of that cycle and try and rebalance, it's actually you're, you're fighting the entire grain of almost material society now. So it's a very sort of powerful practice and requires a lot of sadhana to, to do it and hold in it. Yes. So if you simplify your environment, it, it's amazing how just in your own environment at home, if you, if you put everything out of the way except for the thing that you're working on right then, it, it's, you feel very calm and peaceful. And you, you can focus on that one thing. There's so many things. I, had a, I met a personal organizer once, and she told me that excess items in your house amount to visual noise. And, and then I get used to it. This overload of visual noise uh, coming from every direction. That's why uh, advanced spiritualists try to live in simplified environments. Because there's so much inside that you miss when you're uh, distracted by the external world. Yes, we were downtown today. Where did we go? Leicester Square. We were in Leicester Square. There are more than a few distractions down there, <laughs> St. Louis. But, uh, and we, we met so many people, we were introducing them to the Bhagavad Gita. We were just uh, randomly meeting people who were uh, open-minded, and the way we could tell they were open-minded was just by saying hi to them. And when we said hi, then we could get an immediate feedback whether they wanted to talk or not, a, 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 an immediate conscious exchange. And so many people did want to talk, and they came over, and everyone agreed that it's a good idea to be more spiritual in their life. And so, uh, the final point I'd like to make is to uh, keep your goals in front of you. If you uh, take any of these principles, you write them down and you say, oh, any of these points, if you take any of them, and they seem to resonate with you, make them visible so that you see them every day, right in front of you, because it's easy to have uh, these things go out of our purview and then we forget about them. So make it a, a primary focus in your life by keeping them visible in front of your face. You can make a sign, you can make a note, and uh, practice them regularly. And you'll, you'll experience, even with, with a little bit of endeavor, with these basic principles, that you'll feel more determined in your spiritual life. And the final conclusion is that you can engineer your own determination. You don't have to depend on nature. You can, you can nurture this in your own life but, but with a few simple practices. Okay? Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Not to the Armarman, not to the Armarman.
Nachere Armarman, Nachere Armarman, hey, Nachere Armarman, Nachere Armarman, Nachere Armarman, Nachere Armarman.